You're listening to the Inquisitive Red Podcast, the show that brings you philosophical ponderings of your life from a bird's eye view. Now, here's your host, Shah. Hello, everyone. It's Shaw here. Welcome to the Inquisitive Wren podcast. I wanted to uh, actually give you a warm welcome. And so I hope you've joined me here on my YouTube channel. And I hope that you've been listening to the Inquisitive Wren on Apple Podcasts and all streaming platforms. And I hope you've been enjoying the episodes. I've got some really interesting interviews coming up. But I wanted to really uh, just express one of the reasons why I'm doing the podcast, because many people have asked, uh, they, they're very aware of my spiritual work, but also of my counseling practice. So they're aware of all the work that I do. Uh, and so they, you're probably asking yourself, well, why are you doing a podcast? You know, I think there's this misconception that a therapist should be hidden and not seen only in a therapeutic session. And also that, uh, you know, we dedicate our life's work to therapy. Well, some of that's true, but not the part about being hidden away. Certainly I was never hidden away before I became a therapist, nor do I plan to now as I go into my, I think it's my 26th year of being a therapist. So I've done this for many, many years, and I have a lot of experience. But one of the things that I've always enjoyed juxtaposed with uh, my practice is that outside of my work, and I've always, you know, brought this into sessions that it's important to have a balanced life, uh, that I do try and live the walk as well to have a balanced life. And so uh, whereas some of my friends are not on social media a lot, in fact, most of them aren't. Uh, and, you know, everybody has a choice. Um, and so <laughs> certainly we all have lives outside of the work that we do. And a lot of my friends aren't therapists. I do have friends who are, but a lot of them aren't. They're just in regular profession. Some of them don't work either. So you have to have a balanced life, I believe, in order to move through life um, fairly easily or, let's say, stress or pain free. Now, there will be challenges in life, of course, but I believe that it's the things that we fill up our days, hours, minutes with that help us to navigate through life. So this podcast is about exactly that, navigating through life. And so I am seeking to speak to people uh, who have what I may call an interesting life. You may not agree, but I think everybody's lives can have aspects of interesting bits to it. I don't believe everybody's life is, uh, shall we say, interesting. And I think people will agree with that. Certainly, um, there's <laughs> certainly a lot of truth in what happens with therapy. We get to the truth of things. Um, and certainly some people feel that they have very normal lives, regular lives. And I think that's OK. Everybody doesn't have to be have this big, interesting life. Uh, and also their life may be interesting to them, but perhaps not to other people. Uh, and so. I thought it was uh, important to be clear about a why I've started the podcast, which is the reason why is because I want to speak to people who have different aspects of, uh, of their life, who maybe have changed their work, their jobs, who've had to navigate their way through life, who've had to fly above some things, who've had to make changes, you know, things come out of the blue. And it just so happens that, yes, I will be interviewing some people that I know, of course, because I happen to know some interesting people, but also who I think are interesting anyway, but also uh, I believe that some of their stories will help to inspire people. So there's a lot of talk in the world about uh, inspiration, gurus, people are repeating quotes, and it's very, very popular to take people's creative identities and make them their own in fact, somebody recently sent me something about someone, uh, a, a man, who uh, is telling people that he has a master's degree, that he's a counselor, he's a therapist, he's a life coach, he's all these things. 
And actually, there's no evidence of any of that. Um, you know, that, that person brought it to my attention for a couple of different reasons. But it's frightening to know that there's a lot of people out there who see someone's identity and try and take it for their, themselves, for their own, but they don't want to do the actual real work. So it's okay to admire someone, but I'm talking about being inspired, which is very different. It's not taking somebody's intellectual property or what they've worked hard for. It is being inspired by them to look at their own lives and to maybe make some changes so that they too can excel or maybe not even excel, shall we say, but to make a change that's more conducive to their life purpose and where they feel they're going. Um, so this is what the Inquisitive Rim podcast is all about. Never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button right now. Thank you for your support. You make this podcast possible. Now, back to the show. Uh, to answer some of the questions, because I've received a few bits, um, I won't be talking about uh, specific clients or cases or anything like that. I am a professional. So no, that's not what I talk about. Even if I reference a case study, it's changed to the point where it's just unrecognizable. And I also usually run this by my supervision. I do have supervision as a therapist. Any therapist worth their weight in gold will have some supervision. Um, and so I've been a therapist for many, many years. I do uh, value the work very much so. And I know that I'm doing what I'm meant to be doing. Uh, but I also know that I was meant to be doing the other jobs that I did before that and the jobs I've done since because there is other work that I do take on. Uh, and I juxtapose it again, um, sorry, with, not against, but with <laughs> my therapeutic practice. And um, some of that work includes spiritual work, which is very, very different, totally, I would say, different from my counseling or life coaching. So just so that we're clear, my counseling practice or psychotherapy practice uh, focuses on, you know, different issues of people's lives um, it could be anything, absolutely anything, name it. That's what it could be. I, there isn't anything I don't treat really, unless it's a psychiatric condition whereby they should, the person should be having psychiatric treatment. Um, then I can usually take it on. However, I do turn people away because I know my expertise. I know what I'm trained. I know what I'm good at. Um, and so I, I'm happy to signpost people elsewhere to perhaps a specialist in some other area or field. I can't take on any, everything and anything. And there are areas that I don't have expertise in and therefore I have to signpost people on, um, which is good, which is good. It's good that I know about the other bits and I can signpost you on. The important thing is to always, you know, going back to my to the issue about the person sort of portraying themselves to be something they're not, is to vet your therapist. Do your due dil diligence. Ask your therapist before you work with them. Ask them about their insurance. Do they have, do they have supervision? Uh, how long they've been practicing, their training, you know, what they're trained in, what they're trained to help with, um, you know. You do have to just very much like you have to find the right person for uh, anything else to fix your boiler, to uh, mow the lawn. You have to find the right therapist. So there will be therapists that you don't gel with for whatever reason. Certainly, I haven't gelled with every therapist. I've certainly started and stopped therapy with people that I haven't felt uh, they were capable of whatever I was bringing. Um, and so some of it's to do with their training, but some of it's to do with who they are as well. So we, we're people, 
need to know that yes we're in the room too we're in the room but it is about you <laughs> the session is about you it's not about the therapist it is about you but we're in the room so it is important or we're in the space um the zoom room these days <laughs> the team's room uh but it's it is important to uh feel safe feel that you're in good hands feel that you you're working with someone in a very intimate space as well a very you know safeguarded space with someone who can help you otherwise what's the point there is no point you'll only go away frustrated with no um real change and it's not going to be helpful um i once had somebody come to me after seeing a therapist for a long time and when i looked at it all they said the only reason that they stayed for so long is because they're quite loyal. They have the same companies that they've dealt with for their utilities and everything. But that's not a reason to stay in therapy. So you have to find the right person to work with. And sometimes, you know, I won't be the right person to work with either. But I have to say, after all these years, usually I'm able to spot that straight away. So I always need to speak to you first. Uh, I try now to have a quick Zoom with you first before we agree to work together, um, because we need to know that's for you and for me. It's your time, it's your money, it's my time, uh, it's my money as well, because if you're not the person I should be helping, then somebody else could have the session. So it's all round for both of us, um, but don't be afraid to leave sessions now sometimes there's a, another reason for that but don't be afraid to stop your therapy if it if you feel it's not helping or the therapist isn't helpful um so vet your therapist because this guy is yeah it's um it's not good uh so anyway the other thing is the spiritual aspect which is very different which is what i was touching upon before so you know, I know a lot of people will debate the whole issue of mediumship and psychic abilities and all that stuff. Debate away. I'm not in that debate. Uh, there is no debate for me. I know what I get, what I see, what I feel, what I sense, what I give to people. And so for me, uh, that's a very different thing. So yes, I do help people in, this, in the sense of mediumship. So people ask me, well, why do you have these two websites? You, I can see you have a counseling website. Then I went over to the Sears Light and you offer psychic readings. Well, I feel that it's important to keep them different and separate. Um, I did mention recently on somebody's uh, interview that I may consider combining websites, but it's doubtful. All these years, I've had two separate websites and it's worked. It's for a reason. They are very different. And I wouldn't want anyone to get the impression that in any way I'm using psychic abilities in a counseling session. That's just not the case. If you know anything about the work, it's just not possible. I'm not in that space. I'm very lucky that the two don't co coincide. They don't um, run into each other. They don't coexist at all. When I'm in a therapeutic session, I am very much there in the room. It's being guided by whatever somebody's telling me and what I'm telling the person. In a mediumship session, I'm pretty much literally what it says on the 10, the medium. I'm literally repeating because I'm clairaudient. I hear spirit. I'm literally repeating what someone says to me clairaudiently to the person. I'm not, I'm, that's it. I, yes, I'm there, but I'm the medium, literally, the go-between. And that's just not the case in therapy. So you cannot compare them. You cannot, they're two separate things. Therapy scientifically has been proven to help and work. Spiritual mediumship hasn't been proven to help and work. The only proof I have is my own spiritual practices and my notes and things that I've taken over the years and how I've helped people. That's it. But taking it to, to the lab, as we say, and trying to work out to figure out, you know, case studies in that sense. And as you all know, there's been so many people out there trying to debunk and, 
you know, people spend their whole lives on trying to make people out to not be who they are, which is why I mentioned the guy who's pretending to be something he isn't because that's not helpful. (laughs) It only feeds into these debunkers, people out there who think that everybody's a fraud if they believe or say they're a medium. Not everyone is. Um, (laughs) What what would I get out of that? Now, I want to give a quick example. And, And this is how different it is to therapy. Um, I was in a public demonstration in, um, was it Pembridge Place? I think it may have been Pembridge Place in uh, London. It's one of the spiritualist churches I give platform readings to. So platform readings is a medium stands literally on a platform. People come into the room. A medium stands literally on a platform. People come into the room, into the space. Uh, It's usually in a spiritualist church, sometimes a hall. Um, and just randomly is guided to somebody um, or depending on how the medium works, will get the, the spirit through and then tell people, well, I've got this person here. Uh, that's pretty much how it works for me. But a lot of times spirit do guide me and point the person out to me. Um, but I said to somebody, uh, now this, I'm giving this example for the debunkers because um I've always heard this thing about cold reading. I, since I was young, I always thought, well, what is cold? What is that? How, how can you cold read? What does that even mean? Um, but I was drawn to somebody. I, I re- really remember this because it was such a stark, evidential reading. Um, I was drawn to a lady that was sitting way at the back. And I think my service was literally done. I was coming up to the end. I think that was my last reading. And I said, I want to come to this lady, I'm just, you know, because I've got this person anyway. I described them. The person said they knew who it was. And I, all I remember, because I don't remember the whole reading, but the bit I, that really stood out was, I remember that what I was hearing, I could feel the energy of the person telling me, I can't, I think it may have been grandparent, I can't remember, but uh, the person said, tell her she's already canceled two dentist appointments. She's got one at 10 a.m. on Tuesday. Tell her not to cancel that. So I just repeated it. And the lady's mouth dropped wide open (laughs) And there, the, there was a lady sitting next to her and she was nudging her like that. And I said, you know, can you please say something? Because it's helpful if I know if you can understand it. If you don't, if you don't, I'll, I'll ask this person to say more. <laughs> and she said, yes, I understand that. I had two, appo- two dentist appointments. I canceled them. And I've got the next one next Tuesday at 10 a.m. I mean, then my mouth flew open and I looked around the room and everybody's mouth was open. Now, I, you know what? I'm giving this. I'm very aware that it probably sounds a bit egotistical or something, but I'm giving this because when people say people are cold reading, why not the appointment at 3 p.m. on a Thursday? Why not? You've already canceled five appointments, not two. Why? How can it be that specific? Why 10 a.m.? How? And, you know, that was the last part of the information. She'd given other bits that the lady could take as well. But it was that bit where, for some reason, for me, it stood out for me. Now, I have to say, I do remember her approaching me after the session saying, Everything you said, and I can remember because a lot of it, I don't remember what I say, but I remember that. Anyway, my take on people debunking mediums and they, as you know, sometimes people are envious, you know, when you do, well, I've certainly had a lot of a training um, in psychodynamic therapy. So we do discuss a lot of envy, things like that. So envious people usually want to, um, ruin things for other people. So rather than seeing somebody as receiving healing from these messages, people focus on the actual messenger uh, and, and say that they're fake and that they're making it up. So I think there's envy in that, that 
There's envy when people believe that you may have something that they don't. And there'll be envy when people believe or perceive that you've helped someone in some way that they couldn't. So the only way to ruin that is to focus on the messenger and, you know, uh, put them down. So that's my take on that. There's more. And I think I've, I've got some interview or something scheduled where I'm going to be talking to a medium. We're going to talk about things like that. Um, but I mentioned that because, you know, I certainly, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's not the most relaxing thing you can do is stand up in a room in front of people and actually trust that you're going to be able to give them evidence of life after death. I mean, you've got to be, you've got to have some goal, some gumption and goal to do that. You've got to have a real sense of, yes, okay, I, I think I get, you know, I'm pretty sure I can do this. And that's what I have just because of years of working with spirit. So and I know it's healing for people just because of all the years. Now, I have had some, you know, at one point I was asked to appear on a TV show, a psychic TV show, which I did for years, uh, for not long, but for a couple of years, a year and a half, I think it may have been, or maybe a little less. It was, it was okay, but some of the psychics there were very disturbed. I remember there were racist psychics, there were racist producers there. Uh, there were people who I found quite disturbed overall. Um, yeah, in many ways. And, and, you know, in a way, it's, it's disturbing. And that, I believe that's why a lot of um, what we try and do as intuitives is look down upon because it's not a physical thing. You can't really touch it and see it. But what people refuse to acknowledge is that nor can you touch and feel the mind either. But the thing is, you, you can touch and feel the brain, but not the mind. But the thing is, you, we've got um, the remnants of what the mind can do. So for instance, if the mind thinks it wants to run a 5K, the body can do it and there's evidence but what evidence? How do you know the mind made that decision? How do you know that? You can't touch it or feel it. Anyway, I could go on and on into that kind of thing. But whenever somebody has asked me about my mediumship, and people don't usually challenge me because they know I can go with them neck to neck, I don't usually, and I, I haven't ever before because I'm just not in that space spiritually I believe you should be able to believe whatever you believe, and I should be able to believe whatever I believe. And for me, that's where it ends. Um, but I, I'm still allowed to give my thoughts and opinions on that. So I know I'm not cold reading. I don't even know what that is. I don't even know how you would do. How are you cold? Are you, do you have to be cold? And I'm not being facetious here. Do you have to actually be physically cold to do? It? Well, maybe I am being facetious. Now that I say it, I, it is facetious, isn't it? Um, cold. What does that mean? Like you go in cold, I guess, not having any information. Well, oh, I see. So, well, I suppose in that sense, it is a cold reading because I don't know those people. You see, all I had to do was allow my resistance to open up. Okay. I see. Now the problem I do have. So, okay. So yes, I would agree. I will agree that it is a cold reading in the sense that I am not warm to those people. I don't know any of those people. I just trust that because they've come to a spiritualist church that they must have some kind of nice feeling, although that's not always been the case. Again, I've worked, I've, I've seen very negative, mean, horrible, nasty people working as psychics. So, um, but also uh, I, uh, I, I've lost track there, but uh, what was I going to say? 
Oh, yes, about the spirituals coming to a spiritualist church. So, but also that's not guaranteed that you're, you know, spiritual just because you say you're spiritual, that you, you're not racist or you haven't got any negativity about you. Not at all. Everybody's human. So everybody will have that some aspect of them. Um, but overall, okay, so cold, that's it. That's it. So cold. Well, yes, I'm going into a space. I, not cold, though. I Cold in the sense that I don't know anybody. And now people that I know do have come to my readings. People do come to my demonstrations. They do. I never get information from them. I don't usually read for family. I have before. I have given information I, because I couldn't help it. It was just coming through. It's always been right. I remember saying to some, a relative, well, they're not really a relative. They think they are a relative, but they're not related to me, which is very interesting. I know they're not related to me, but they think they are. And, um, <laughs> but I did say, well, this person's come through. This is the person's name. And the, and the person said, oh my God, yeah. That, I mean, the person died well before I was ever born and I had no clue the person exists. I, didn't, I don't know anything about the person. But I could see them. I described them. I said their name. I said what he was doing at the time. And, and, the, and the, the wannabe relatives said, oh, my God, that sounds, oh, my God. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, I do have a sense of humor. It can be a little bit wicked sometimes. <laughs> okay, so, or dark, not dark sense of humor. I think it's quite light. I think. <laughs> anyway. Um, Yes, so, <laughs> the wannabe relative. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so, um, yeah, so the thing is cold. So, yeah, okay, so I'm going in. I don't know anybody usually. I, I mean, I don't know anybody there. Um, I think I've gave, I gave a reading, somebody who worked at the church. I got information, I gave them, but I don't know them. I just see them when I go in and, you know, which is, was at the time once every three months i by the way i don't plan on doing any any demonstrate public demonstrations at the moment i haven't got the time um maybe in the future um obviously with the pandemic it just wasn't possible and i wasn't interested in doing online uh in terms of a public demonstration so cold yes i don't know people but i'm not guessing and that's the difference I believe that when these skeptics and because I'm skeptical of everything, even the information that comes through, but I believe when people are debunking mediumship and they talk about cold readings, they're thinking or saying or meaning that it's made up when it isn't. How could I make that up? I mean, there's loads of examples. Okay, I'll give another one. Train ticket lady. This is one of my favorite ones. In fact, train ticket lady, I call a train ticket lady. Um, she now, so train ticket lady was somebody I'll never forget. I'll never forget only because it's unique, but also she phone. It was a phone reading. It was a phone reading and she had lost. She was supposed to go see her son. I'll never forget that. And she'd lost or misplaced her ticket. She just moved into a place and she lost and misplaced her ticket. So she rang up and wanted like a remote viewing for me to see. Uh, so I know, I, gosh, I can already imagine what you're thinking. People can't see that. Well, I can sometimes, you know, I mean, when I'm asked to or when I'm meant to. Now, that doesn't mean I'm a voyeur and I'm looking in on people. I'm not. I never, I never get that. Only when it's very specific and it's spiritual. And spirit, and she, phone, I was on that TV show. She actually phoned in and asked to speak to me, um, as you do. And um, she spoke to me and said, you know, I can't find this train ticket. I'm supposed to go see my son. It's, I, can't, I can't afford to buy another one, da, 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 da. And so I tuned in and I could see it. I can't remember where it was, though. I think if I... I think the feedback may be on my website on the sea is light. I think I put most of it on there, but sh I think it was in a bag. I can't, it's been years ago now, God, but I do remember that. Anyway, I could see the ticket in this 
space or place. And I told her and she found it and she actually rang in, in, back in the show and said, oh, my God, it was there. I mean, how in a house where I, that I've never seen, don't know where, I don't even know what part of the country she was. I know she was in England because, you know, but how can I, how, tell me, how could I have made, okay, so you could say I guessed it. Well, this particular bag was specific and it was a unique bag and that's why it stood out. How would I know what bag it was? It wasn't like a bag bag, like a plastic bag. Or it was a particular bag of a particular color and consistency. So, for me, as a scientist, I think, okay, hold on here. You know, why? So I'm open. I know that, A, and this is why I like to say and give examples of everything, is people think, okay, you've got a psych psychiatric condition if you think you're a medium. Well, this is what I say. We only have the human mind to work out the human mind, which means we're limited from Jump Street. Human mind's done really well. I remember I was on... Um, what was show was that years ago? Kilroy. That's right. I, I was asked by the Kilroy show to go and do some hypnotherapy on a lady, which I did. I mean, yeah, I didn't even know the show. I, did, I said, what is that show? But anyway, I went, they picked me up. I went and did this healing thing. And I, I have put snippets or James has put snippets on. Um, I can't remember where it is. It might be on my website. I don't know. I don't. Anyway, it's out there. And uh, so, yeah, so she, that was fine. But then, because, you know, these shows, I didn't know this, but I was told afterwards that they put plants in the audience, that they put people in to um, debate you. So there were people in the audience debating something about the hypnotherapy or something. Even when the lady that I treated sat right next to me saying, I felt this, I felt that. And I remember even uh, the visualization, they were saying, oh, well, you were talking about going in a spaceship. What they, what they didn't know was something the lady had said to me beforehand, which I still won't divulge. And that's one of the reasons why I used a particular visualization. All these things are important, especially when you're a trained hypnotherapist. But, you know, I wasn't going to divulge that. I just had to take the L, as they say. Um, but yeah, the the um, there was some guy, a plant, which I found out later in the audience, saying, trying to say something, and I said to him, "You know, you the thing is, you only have the human mind to work out the human mind." I remember Robert Kilroy saying, "Well, we've done quite well with the human mind." I said, "Yeah, we have, but think about it. Just think about it. We only have the human mind." And there was a guy in front of me going like struggling to understand it. And he even said to me later, I, I get it, but it was, it was very deep. <laughs> um, and I remember saying to him, look, if you can't understand that, then I don't know what I do. I can't really help you. I, I can't, un I can't help you. You're never going to be able to understand anything outside of what you, your, your limitations. Um, and everybody started clapping, <laughs> which was interesting. But I say all this, oh, again, it sounds like, you know, I'm, I say all this because I can't make this stuff up. I'm not that talented. I, I can't, how can I make that up? That a train ticket was in that, how, how can I, I just can't. Um, the latest, the latest example I, I gave recently, I can't remember who I gave it to, this is what happens a lot of the times with my memory bits stick out and bits don't and I can bring them to the forefront that's just memory isn't it so um I remember being out with a few people and uh I got the sense that I was going to hear a clash or crash of glasses and I kept turning around looking for it. I couldn't spot it. I just kept going, oh, my God. You know, I, all I could hear was crash, bang. And I was, like, really unsettled. And somebody said, what's the matter? And I said, I, I just feel like somebody's about to drop some glasses. Anyway, after a few minutes, I mean, a few minutes passed, I turned around. I could see a waitress holding a bunch of glasses. And she walked by. And I was kind of bracing myself. And nothing happened. I think it happened a couple of times. 
I recently told somebody about this, but I have forgotten about this whole thing. And then I remembered it. I remembered all the bits about it. And she walked by a couple of times, nothing happened. And it was when I just forgot all about it. I heard, we all heard crash, bang, glasses just fell all over. She dropped the whole tray. Um, now, okay, you could say that could happen. Yes, of course it can, and it does. Um, but they're usually quite well trained. I mean, there was no indication of anything. She looked quite confident. I couldn't really see her anyway for a long time. I just got the feeling well before I could see anybody. I did. It's not as though this is what I'm the point I'm trying to make about the whole cold calling, looking at somebody. I never even saw the person. I didn't know if it was a woman or a man or anything. I just felt like somebody's about to drop a tray. And all I could hear was the clashing of the glasses. Um, so I didn't see somebody struggling with a tray or I didn't hear somebody say, oh, I'm nervous about the carrying the tray. There was none of that. There was no indication whatsoever. So I don't know how we're going to make these things up. I mean, I've got loads. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, email me at inquire at theinquisitiverin.com. That's E-N-Q-U-I-R-E at theinquisitiverin.com. Be sure to check all social media, especially the Facebook page, for new topics and new interests. And if you're an expert in the field, I'd love to hear from you. Or if you'd just like to have a chat, contact me. Let's get you on the show. Now, let's get back to the show. Anyway, I feel like I'm going on too much about this because that wasn't what I was meant to do. But the Inquisitive Wren podcast will touch upon a lot of these topics. Um, you know, I love the psychotherapeutic aspect as well. So I like to talk about you know, what may help you, what's helped you in the past, what hasn't helped you in the past. Um, the things that you may be interested in is as far as therapy goes, you know, there's lots of complementary therapies out there like rebirthing and, you know, rolfing and uh, the reflexology. We know it's a touch therapy, but how is it helpful? How does that help you? Uh, things like EFT, you know, the tapping you know, a little bit controversial NLP and hypnotherapy, you know, two hypnotherapists started NLP. So what's the difference kind of thing? <laughs> a lot of people talk about that. So I'll be talking to a lot of different people about different therapies, but also about their lives. Some of it has nothing to do with therapy. Some, of, some people I know have never been to therapy, never had to go to therapy or anything like that. Um, what I will say about the therapeutic aspect, I want to, I, now I'm going to debunk <laughs> some myths out there about therapy and therapists and all that. Uh, most therapists would have had therapy. Otherwise, how do you know what it's like to be in a therapy session? How would you know what it's like to have therapy? You must have had therapy. I'd be very worried about someone going to somebody for therapy when they've never had therapy. That, that's just unheard of. So most courses, you must have therapy. Now, supervision is totally different from therapy. I have supervision for my practice. Supervision is about your practice, what you're doing. Um, it's not therapy for you. Totally different. Your therapist is not, uh, your, sorry, your your therapist is not your supervisor and your supervisor is not your therapist at all. Now, I've been very lucky. I've had the same supervisor for years, pretty much since I started my practice. Um, pretty much since I started my practice. Uh, she's fantastic and I'm very lucky. So just like you have to find the right supervisor, you have to find the right therapist. I feel like I'm repeating myself. So maybe I've said this before. Um, but also there's a myth that all, you know, therapists have cushy lives. They haven't done, that's why they can, you know, deal with therapy. No, not, not the case at all. 
uh, most therapists, my experience has been, have had challenges to face in life, just like everybody else. And that's why they're able to help other people. So they may have had some real challenges. They may still have challenges. You know, if you're living, going through life, you will still have your own challenges. The difference is, and what uh, I believe that most therapists have a couple of things in common. And one is that most people who are therapists, most, I won't say all, are able to somehow affect a space where they put themselves in the background and allow the other person to come forward because that's how they can see the person. That's how they can help the person. That's my view and my take on it. Um, I don't believe everybody can be a therapist. You know, a lot of people may pretend to be. Um, I saw somebody say recently, uh, on some interview. Well, you know, I'm not a therapist, but I wonder if that was happening. And it was so clear that no. So you probably shouldn't have said I'm not a therapist because it's clear you, you, you've got no therapeutic. And I'm saying that because um, how do I say this? Um, just be you, just be you, just be your human self, your human self. That's who I am outside of a therapeutic session. I'm my human self with my sense of humor, with my mistakes, with my flaws, with everything else. I've got tolerances. I've got intolerances. I like people. I don't like some people. <laughs> That's very clear. I mean, you know, so I, I am human. I let some people in. I don't let a lot of people in. Um, I have very close knit people around me that I've known for years. And I have close knit family around me. <laughs> um, that sometimes I like, sometimes not so much. Um, you know, so <laughs> I'm human. They're human. And that's the difference. Just because I'm a therapist, it doesn't mean that I can tolerate anything and everyone. And or I still have people still push my buttons. You know, I still get people not being nice at times, not in therapy, but um, in life, you know, because I do other work and sometimes people will have their stuff. And I'm able, the, the thing is, I'm able to step back and let them have their stuff. That's who they are. I'm not going to be able to change that. That's who they are. And they can do their, their stuff somewhere else. So I do have my boundaries and I'm able to put up a boundary. Um, you know, you, you must in life. And so in that sense, I think for me, I'm pretty strong in that sense that um, you're just not going to be able to do or treat me a particular way. It's just not possible. I'm not going to allow it, that kind of thing. Um, and so I've taught other people around me to be the same, which is good. Um, and so I think it, it just being in life, you, oops. Um, I think just being, you know, navigating through life. And that's what the podcast is about, navigating your way through life. I've certainly had to learn things in life. Um, I've certainly suffered lots of different losses or, you know, gains as well. Lots of highs, lots of lows. It's life. If you're living on this earth, you will have experienced life. And life can be difficult sometimes and it can be quite easy sometimes. Certainly nice and easy at times as well. Uh, we all find bits and pieces to help us through. In no way have I ever portrayed or suggested that life is, you know, easy and there's no issue and I've got everything in the world and all. No, I'm human and that's, and I've had my challenges and still have in different ways. And that's, uh, that makes me qualified along with my training to help people. Uh, Somebody, a therapist once said to me in a particular setting, um, well, you know, I, I chose to be a therapist because life, my life was so good uh, that I thought I would help other people. Yeah, no, 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 not at all. That's not why you're a therapist, that you wouldn't be a therapist, pretty much. You just wouldn't. <laughs> you just wouldn't. Um, I'm sorry, but you wouldn't. It's my experience of all these years. I've never met a therapist who's had a very easy, easygoing life. No. Now, everybody's life is not tragically bad or anything. I mean, oof, you know, um, 
not everybody's life is like that. I can think of therapists who've done some really good work writing books. You know, I'm not going to name names, but, but people have written books on things and people offer courses who've had really tragic lives, really tragic lives. Um, and for whatever reason, they feel they can help people in the form of books or courses and things. Great. And I'm sure that they help a lot of people. But every therapist hasn't had a tragic life like that. It's like everything. Every all of our experiences have been different. But I just I I I can't. There were other signs too with this therapist that no, your life is not. Otherwise, you wouldn't be. You wouldn't have be doing what this what you're doing. You wouldn't be saying this what you're doing. You know, there's there were obvious signs that. Mm, there were challenges there and that's okay. This is about evolvement as well. And I like uh, the Tao Te Ching that says, uh, knowing others is intelligence and knowing yourself is enlightenment. And I believe we're all on that path to enlightenment, uh, including therapists. You know, I'm, I still go on courses, continue professional development. I will always continue to uh, learn and be open. And I did a course recently at this stage in my career. It was huge. Um, I'm very, very pleased about that. Uh, so, you know, we, we continue to learn as long as you're open, I believe. But yes, I ha certainly have had challenges in life. So all therapists. Now, there is something. Oh, okay. Uh, lastly, I'll touch on this. Somebody recently said to me, well, they, I think they watch a show. I don't know what show it is. I'm, I'm afraid. I, I can't remember. I, I think they told me, but I don't remember. But this is a friend who said to me, well, you know, what your therapist in the UK. So these therapists here, yeah, they're in the States. Uh, they hug people when they No, I it. I think it depends on your training. So I think it's important in therapy to keep boundaries. And so I. It is concerning because the person told me that the, most of the therapists that they know that, that are on TV hug people and go to their houses and all sorts of things, which is concerning. However, what I said to the person is, look, it's TV. I'll, I'll say this in a second. So it's TV. So it may be scripted. I don't know. Um, perhaps they've got a dip. Perhaps it's coaching very different from therapy from the, and that's the other thing life coaching is not therapy it's not counseling it's not psychotherapy at all in any way shape or form so if a coach if a life coach is trying to therapize you <laughs> they're not doing their coaching job it's anything but counseling um, the one thing I was going to say, I have been asked, I've had, I've had some really interesting requests. I was asked to be on, I, I will say this, you know, most people that I know, know this, but I'm going to tell you guys, I just feel comfortable telling you some, I'm not going to tell you all because I don't want to put certain networks on blast as they say. Um, but I was asked to be on what's the dining thing. What's the dining program? where you people come to your house and you make a meal. I was asked to do that. I was asked to, oh, should I say, yeah, I'm going to say this one. I have to. I was asked by a, a major network to come on. This was during the Queen Mother's, uh, this was during the Jubilee in 2012. I was asked to be on TV to channel the Queen Mother. Now, the, the feedback from certain people I know was that, oh, my God, they trust you. They, you know, they trust you to do this. They know you can do that. Why would they ask you? They, they've asked you to do it. Yeah, no, my ego doesn't stretch that big. I, I have an ego because we all do, but no, that's nice. Thank you for the offer, but no, thank you. That's, that's, um, for me, I'm not in it for that kind of show. Not that kind of show. Uh, the other thing that I've been approached to do was something else, but it was recently, but it was around the pandemic. So I'm, I'm not going to 
it's actually not a bad thing, but I'm not going to talk about it actually, because it may still be, it's still on the table as such. It was just put on hold because of the pandemic. So I'm not going to go there. Um, but there was something else that I was asked to do. Um, and I'm still on the fence about it. So if I'm going to do a reality, be on a reality show um, as a therapist, there's bits about that that I'm concerned about um, because I've got to do my job. So I cannot hold back because a camera is rolling. And I'm always concerned about the person's privacy and their well-being, how that's going to play out, whatever's revealed. And also, I can't really control the narrative of what they show the person on TV. The other, in other words, I am always concerned about the, the persons, the person I'm helping, treating. I'm always concerned about their well-being and how it's going to leave them and affect them about this being on a national platform, whatever's revealed in the session on TV. So I know people do it. I know therapists do it. And I believe it's helpful because it does help people to understand what a therapeutic session can be like. And I think there needs to be a bit more of that. There's a bit of, um, I don't believe it's being portrayed necessarily as it really is a lot on TV. Um, and that's probably because it can't be, because it can't be. Um, but also uh, in movies as well, some things just aren't as they are. Um, yeah, so and it's, oh, I'm not going to go into the other office. And, they, you know, I, I think because I, I've done TV before and things like that. Maybe that's why I get the offers, which is fine. Keep them coming. I can only say yes to some things and some things I won't be able to do. I'm grateful. I'm very flattered that these things are being offered. Um, but I'm, I'm always thinking about the other person. The cooking thing was funny and interesting, but it's just not me. So that's it, really. I just wanted to pretty much talk about the inquisitive wren that's the podcast that's a bit about me as well some things i plan to say some things i hadn't uh but if you are interested in being a guest on the show the email address is below send me a quick email i review them all i am specific only because of my profession and i also have to vet people i have to make sure that people are in the space that they a healthy space to be in uh, and I am equipped to make that judgment. And so I'm quite happy to speak to anyone. Um, I do have boundaries around certain things. In other words, I'm not going to be interviewing clients or anything. I've, people I've worked with, things like that. I know coaches do that, but in therapy, I'm very protective. No. Nope. Um, and so... Yes, I think that's it. Any questions, though, send me a quick email. Happy to answer anything. Follow social media, though, Inquisitive Wren. It, so it's Inquisitive Wren on Instagram. It's The Inquisitive Wren on Facebook. And it's, well, you're here, YouTube, The Inquisitive Wren. The, Inquis uh, the um, Sea is Light, my, which is the spiritual bits. They're all separate, I know. Uh, and now we've got this one, the Inquisitive Rim. But that one's a little bit better. I, I, I can interact a bit on there with the spiritual stuff. Um, that's okay. And, of course, the Sears Light YouTube channel is up. Ah, so just to quickly say, I started the Sears Light YouTube channel in July 2020. It was right when the pandemic started. So pandemic started mid-March. So just a couple of months later, started the YouTube. And that was because I was getting an influx of requests for readings. Now, with the pandemic, I also found people were suffering, people were furloughed, people had lost their jobs. So I was feeling some type of way about accepting payment as well. Nobody ever said anything to me. It was my thought, my feeling. And I'm a business person, so I don't have issues with money or asking for money or anything. I believe you have a service, you should pay for it. I've got years of expertise. That's what you're paying for. So I've got no issue with that. Um, 
However, around the spiritual stuff, I was thinking that there were so many people who were a bit frightened and things that I thought it might be helpful just to do some card readings, oracle card readings, you know, make it very visual on YouTube. And that way it's free. You can watch them anytime you want. So I started the channel, which is great. It's still up and running. Although recently I have not. The last video I posted was a February reading. So I'll do one for March. But I think the reason why I haven't, because people have asked me on YouTube, they've sent me messages saying, why aren't you posting as much? I was posting every other week before. That has stopped for two reasons. One, because of time, but also the, the biggest main reason is as much as I enjoy doing those readings, I don't feel drawn to do a lot of them at the moment. And it is because of a very simple reason. I work as a medium. That's my forte. That's what I do. That's what fuels me. Um, I know I'm not, a you know, yes, I can read tarot, I can read the cards, I can do all of that. But my speciality is mediumship. That's what I do. That's what fuels me. That's what gives me life. Uh, and so I'm not, I, that's why I feel the energy is not there for me. Now, I know there are other people with huge followings on YouTube. That, I mean, hundreds of thousands of followers doing tarot readings. Perfect. That's good for them. So, so I feel comfortable stepping back because I know that people can go to them. Now, I said this, this to a person. They said, but it's not you. I know that. And you may be used to me. And that's lovely and great. However, I can only give what I can give. And at the moment, I don't feel it's right for me to carry on doing lots of those readings. I will do what I can, but not loads. I, I think I'll do a monthly reading, whatever I'm guided to do. That's the other thing. Spiritually, I'm guided to feel, sense and do things. And at the moment, it's just not what I'm meant to do. Ah, I will quickly say that, um, Right after I started the channel, I offered to people a free mediumship reading. Well, it, it wasn't free. What I said to them was, uh, you can have the reading, but I'm going to post it on YouTube. So people agreed. They signed release forms, everything. <laughs> but what happened was I did quite a few of those readings. And for some of them, because my you know, my forte is mediumship. I'm in the space. I forgot to press record on, on a few of those. Um, so that was okay, though. I was just happy to give to be able to give the reading because a lot of the people who took it up have been getting readings from me for years. So from me for years. So I was just happy to and I was happy that they passed other people on. It was good to help during that time. People were really struggling in certain ways. Um, but I did forget to press record. But the other thing is, I, yes, I still I have those readings and, and people are aware they sign release forms that they may go on YouTube. But at the moment, I just don't feel like I want to post them on YouTube. I feel like those are readings for them. I might do a little mashup of them. Um, maybe I'm not sure. It's not a priority. Uh I, I thought I might do it to help others to, so that they may think, okay, very much like um, a public demonstration where you go to a public demonstration and the medium goes, can only, you know, the medium has uh, half an hour or an hour, an hour and a half at the most. They can only go to, you know, out of 60, 70 people in the audience or maybe even 40, they can only get to 10 or so if that um, and so the thing is, after those meetings and readings, people often meet because there's usually tea and biscuits in the, you know, in the vestry or whatever. People usually talk about and say, oh, that was so healing. They didn't get a reading, but they got the feeling of healing from a reading that somebody else got. And so it's a knock on effect when you're in a, a, a um, group setting like that, in a public demonstration, you sense and feel the healing, even if the medium wasn't directing the reading to you, even if you didn't receive a, a, a reading, you still felt it. 
So I wanted to translate that to give it to put it on YouTube so that people could watch those readings and get the feeling. And I feel that they will. But but I, I I'm how do I say I just don't feel it's a priority at the moment. I feel as though people are getting what they need where they get it. People still ring up or book readings from the website. I still do what I can when I can. But for the YouTube channel, I haven't put the mediumship up because it's mainly tarot stuff and oracle cards, which is great. I have done a few readings where I, I wrote down bits, channeled through spirit, connecting to people, which is fine. But it's not the mediumship that I normally do. So that's why I haven't been doing a lot on the Sea is Light YouTube channel. This, the, the Inquisitive Wren, I'm pouring a lot into at the moment, which I'm really enjoying. I hope you are as well. I've got some really interesting interviews coming up. Um, great stuff that I'm excited about. Uh, but, you know, again, people are busy in life. So we try and arrange it. Some people are in Australia, some in New Zealand. New Zealand is 13 hours ahead of us. So I recently had a, a reading, uh, reading, sorry, an interview book with somebody in New Zealand and they, because it's 13 hours ahead, they actually got the day and time mixed up because it would have been evening my time and daytime the following day, their time, and they got it mixed up, which happens. I mean, these things happen. Um, so we just reschedule when we can, but we will, we'll get there in the end. I was guided to do the podcast. I'm happy doing it. We're getting, we're getting exceptional downloads on the audio from Apple because I can go in and have a look. Um, and that's good. So I'm happy with that. That's why I'm continuing. If it wasn't doing anything, I wouldn't be. Um, but yes, it's good. So that's why, you know, James said, oh, you know, put up. James is a good friend. I've known him for years and he is technical. So he helps. Um, I can be, but he's more, more so. <laughs> so he set up the, the YouTube channel. So I will be posting those, the uh, visual. Um, I'll be doing another interview with Anne Cecile Veal. She's got a new project coming out. So be sure to follow below, click the link below, subscribe, turn on your notifications so you never miss an episode. And also go over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you, you know, listen to your podcasts. Uh, we're also on Amazon Music, uh, Apple Music, I think it is, and all the other platforms, Stitcher, lots of them. Go over there and follow us as well. So thank you so much for listening. I hope to see you soon. My green screen is a bit all over the place today. Um, but that's what happens sometimes. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Have a great afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. And I will see you soon. Bye. Thanks so much for joining me today. Be sure to follow on all podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. Also, check all social media, especially the Facebook page, as there'll be new topics listed and new guests. And also Twitter will always have the new and upcoming episodes. But make sure you subscribe so that you never miss an episode. See you soon.